Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. We are delighted to have you all here, and we are delighted to welcome and hear from Senator Tom Harkin of Iowa on one of the critical issues facing our government today, how to make it work, how to make it function, and how to keep our democracy going into its third century. Uh, as many of you know, the Brennan Center is a nonpartisan law and policy institute affiliated with NYU. We focus on democracy and justice. We work on voting rights, on an independent judiciary, campaign finance, access to the courts for the poor, and more. And we were started by Justice Brennan's clerks, and we are named after the great late Supreme Court Justice uh, William J. Brennan. And Justice Brennan said, the genius of the Constitution rests not in any static meaning it may have had in a world that is dead and gone, but in the adaptability of its great principles to cope with current problems and present needs. That spirit animates our work and animates this evening. The Living Constitution Lecture brings together policymakers uh, and thinkers and the public to talk about core constitutional issues. We believe that the Constitution, its structure, the way it animates our government is not something for judges alone. It is not something for lawyers alone, not something for law students or even law professors alone. It's really something for all of us. It's a long and endless dialogue. And so in that spirit, the Living Constitution Lecture brings a leading public official to talk about the Constitution as it affects their work and as they see it in the practical day in and day out tasks they face. This is the third such lecture. Uh, Governor, then Governor Janet Napolitano of Arizona gave the first on campaign reform. Last year, we heard from Senator Sheldon Whitehouse on executive power, and we're honored uh, to hear from Senator Harkin today. Let me just thank a few people before I turn the podium over to the dean of the law school, Ricky Rivez. First of all, we do want to thank Justice Brennan's clerks for endowing uh, and creating this lecture. We want to thank the William C. Bullitt Foundation for its support of the Brennan Center's work on filibuster reform. As part of our work trying to make the systems of government function better, we have a year-long project studying the impact of the filibuster, the holds, and the other manifestations of political dysfunction in Washington uh, with an eye toward what can be done, if anything, to ease the problem and make things better. We have quite a few people on the Brennan Center staff to thank. Uh, Senator, uh, Kelly Williams of uh, Des Moines, Iowa, who uh, played the main role, among other things, in the wonderful food and wines of Iowa that we managed to, to share. Chelsea Miller, Diana Lee, Janine plant Cherlin, Mimi Marziani, and Susan Lehman for all their hard work, and Susan Liss, who you'll be hearing from, moderating the questions and answers. And we want to thank Senator Harkin and his staff, especially Dan Goldberg, who works with us at the Brennan Center critically on the fight for legal services for the poor. Senator Harkin is not the principal topic of his talk, but he is the champion in the Congress on making sure that access to justice is meaningful for everybody. Uh, and we're very, very appreciative. Um, and I should acknowledge one other person here uh, who uh, we're hoping at least will ask a question, which is uh, somebody who has remarkable depth of experience and knowledge on how government works at its best, which is my friend and old speechwriting colleague, Ted Sorensen, who's here with us. So we thank you for joining us, too. <laughs> dean Ricky Rivez, known to so many of you, he is the Dean uh, and King Professor of Law here at the Law School. He's one of the nation's leading voices on administrative law and environmental law and how those work together to protect the public interest. He is a active uh, and much appreciated member of the Brennan Center Board of Directors, and he will introduce the lecture and Senator Harkin. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you, Michael. It's an enormous pleasure to welcome Senator Harkin uh, to New York University School of Law tonight, and it's great to see such a large, uh, interested crowd uh, here at Greenberg Lounge. Uh, we at the law school are very proud to be partners with the Brennan Center, and I'm delighted, as Michael noted, to be a member of its board. Uh, tonight's lecture is a terrific example of how the center combines public education, thoughtful analysis, and committed advocacy. 
Our guest tonight, um, our keynote speaker, Senator Harkin, has been elected five times to the United States Senate, and he served five terms before that in the House of Representatives. He represented a district in southwestern Iowa that includes the farming town of Cumming, where he was born and where he still lives, along with 138 other people, including Ruth, his wife of more than 40 years. Uh, recently, Senator Harkin succeeded Senator Kennedy as chairman of the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, which will oversee the implementation of the nation's historic universal health care initiatives in the coming years. He's also the father of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Senator Harkin has long championed Senate reform. Tonight, he has come to a place where the law of democracy is taught and questioned every day. At the Brandon Center, among my colleagues in the faculty, we have a leading group of, um, of colleagues in this area. And he came to speak to us about the effects of the filibuster. In the last two decades, members of both parties have been increasingly willing to abuse Senate rules and obstruct congressional business. To many looking in from the outside, it may seem like nothing will ever improve. But there are voices for change, and Senator Harkin is one of the most respected ones. He first introduced a plan to reform Senate procedural rules in 1995, when his party was in the minority and when he had the most to lose from filibuster reform. Said simply, Senator Harkin supports reducing the number of votes needed to end debate with each successive cloture vote. This would preserve time for debate while eliminating the minority's ability to perpetually undermine measures with majority support. I'm sure uh, he will tell us more about that. And I just have to say how wonderful it is to see someone who got started in life um, as, as a legal aid lawyer um, here at the law school and have ascended to such heights. Uh, we We pride ourselves at NYU Law School uh, for our support for graduates who want to pursue public service careers. It's a very difficult thing to do these days. Um, we try to make sure that all the financial roadblocks are, are taken away by generous support of loan repayment assistance and by guaranteeing uh, pay for um, summer uh, jobs in the public service for first and second year students. And it's, it's a great inspiration uh, to see someone who started as a legal aid lawyer uh, ascend to the highest pinnacle of the U.S. Senate. Senator Harkin, uh, thank you so much for traveling to New York City to speak with us this evening. It's a great honor for the law school to host you tonight. Dean Rivez, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I want to thank the uh, Brennan Center for Justice for inviting me to give the 2010 Living Constitution Lecture. And it is indeed an honor for me to be here, and I'm very grateful. And it's great to see also you. to Michael long time heroes, director. and I mean that most sincerely, Ted Sorensen, who's just been a great leader of progressive thought. And, and if, you, if you want to know what liberals like me believe, just read his books. Uh, read the one, the last one he came out with. It uh, reminded me earlier, it was 10 years ago. I thought it was just a couple of years ago. but. I guess as we get this age, the years seem to collapse a little bit, but why I'm a Democrat. So I, I know this is nonpartisan, but it's a good book, okay? <laughs> but Ted, it's good to see you again. It's uh, good to see you here. Well, let's see. My parents would be astonished to see their son delivering a lecture at New York University at the Brennan Center. My mother was an immigrant from Slovenia who had little formal schooling. Uh, my dad was a coal miner who left school after the sixth grade. Uh, he always said that he went to the eighth grade, but he was Irish and he liked to brag a lot. So, uh, <laughs> but enough of the humility, okay? I'm glad to be here and amongst people who share as I do Justice Brennan's passion for ensuring that our society lives up to the principles of equality and liberty embodied in our Constitution. Before I discuss the pressing need for filibuster reform, here though I do want to salute the Brennan Center uh, in, for what they do uh, to improve the cause of, uh, of access to quality civil legal services for all Americans. As the Dean said, this is very personal to me. Before I was elected to Congress, I was a legal aid lawyer uh, in Iowa. 
Uh, and for years I have, in the Senate and in the House before that, I have fought to strengthen our federal support for legal services. And, um, and the Brennan Center has been a great ally in that effort, and I'm very grateful for your work in this uh, cause. I might just add, just, just to show how life goes on uh, sometimes, how things develop. When I was a legal aid lawyer, one of my fellow legal aid attorneys was a young man by the name of Bob Pratt, P-R-A-T-T, -T, Pratt, Bob Pratt. And in the basement of our legal aid office was the Iowa Civil Liberties Union. And, um, and we had a McCormick there who was a young man. Well, as I got advanced on and I got to the Senate, I was able in the Clinton administration to get them both appointed as federal judges. So I have a former legal services and a former head of the Iowa Civil Liberties Union as federal judges. And, and Bob Pratt went on to distinguish himself as a federal judge. Daniel, you have to help me out on the case now. I don't, I can't remember the case. It was a, it was, it was a prison case brought by some prisoners in Iowa uh, who claimed they were being discriminated against because they were non-believers. And if you attended the Colson, Chuck Colson Bible reading and that kind of thing, that the, the prison ministries, if you attended that, you got all kinds of benefits and tie him out. They got all kinds of good things happen to you. And then and the other prisoners said, well, you know, we're non-believers, and so we can't get that. And so this is, ra this is religious discrimination. A case went before Bob Pratt, and he decided in the prisoner's favor against Chuck Colson. Well, does my heart good anyway. <laughs> and so then it was appealed to the circuit court. Uh, the circuit court upheld Judge Pratt, and then it was appealed to the Supreme Court. And with the Supreme Court, can you imagine, I'm driving to work one morning, and I hear that the Supreme Court the day before had decided this case in favor of the, of the plaintiffs uh, in the case. And, uh, and the person who wrote the opinion was Justice Scalia. <laughs> My email to Judge Pratt was, I, I'm... I just can't believe your new best friend, Justice Scalia, on the Supreme Court. Anyway, uh, but I just thank the Brennan Center for all the help they've been on, on, on legal services. Uh, just so important. Uh, you invited me here to discuss the Senate, in particular my efforts to reform the use of the filibuster, or Rule 22 as it's called. Uh, some might ask why is a senator, who's admittedly not a constitutional scholar, addressing a somewhat arcane Senate procedure, Senate Rule 22, as part of an annual lecture examining the Constitution. The fact is, when we discuss the living Constitution, a conversation regarding this particular legislative procedure I think is both appropriate and timely. A little bit of history. Before the Civil Rights and the Civil War Amendments, each containing vital protections for individual rights and liberties, the founders enacted the Constitution to ensure that our citizens, through their democratically elected government, could effectively address the problems facing the American people. As Justice Breyer wrote, and I quote, the Constitution is a document that trusts people to solve the problems of a community for themselves. And it creates a framework for a government that will help them do so. That framework foresees democratically determined solutions protective of the individual's basic liberties. Justice Breyer. Well, the harsh reality is today that in critical areas of public policy, our Congress is simply unable, unable to respond effectively to the challenges that confront the United States. Consider the major issues that the Senate has tried and failed to address, climate change, energy policy, labor law reform, immigration reform, just to name a few. Quite frankly, uh, there are about 300 bills now that have been passed by the House that are just sitting at the doorstep of the Senate that we can't take up. More than 100 Obama nominees, 85% of whom were reported out of committee unanimously, are being prevented from even being considered by the full Senate. That's over 100. I think it's 112 right now, or 108 or 112 right now. It goes up every week. Uh, just consider this. At this time in George W. Bush's presidency, only eight nominees were awaiting uh, the confirmation process. Quite frankly, the unprecedented abuse of Senate rules has simply overwhelmed the legislative process. 
As Norm Ornstein, a leading political scientist, wrote in a 2008 article titled Our Broken Senate, quote, the expanded use of formal rules on Capitol Hill is unprecedented and is bringing government to its knees. Let me give you a few examples. In February, one senator blocked confirmation of every single executive branch nominee. This past winter, one senator insisted that a 767-page amendment be read out loud and in its entirety, also preventing the Senate from conducting other business for many hours. Now, that's an existing rule of the Senate. You can demand that something be read, but no one really does that anymore unless you really want to stop everything and sort of grind it to a halt. In March, the minority even used arcane Senate rules to block routine committee hearings. There's an old rule of the Senate that some senator, if you want to, can block a committee from meeting. No one ever does it, but it's there, and it was used to block committee hearings. Well, let's be clear, these rules are not new. They've been around for a long time. I mean, some of them have been there for 150 years. But what is new is the level of abuse. I've been in the Senate, as the dean said, for a quarter of a century. Throughout my career, while there have certainly been ideological differences and policy disagreements, the leadership, this is important, the leadership of the minority, sometimes Democrat, sometimes Republican, worked to protect the broad interests of the minority while working with the majority to make the system work. And that has been true, whether, no matter who was in the minority. And during that same period of time, there have been moderates willing to compromise, interested in the act of governing or turning a bill into law. But today, that's not the case. Some members of the minority party are so reflexively anti-government that in their mind, there can be no compromise. Rather than, re rather than responsibly using the rules, they're willing to abuse the Senate procedures in order to sabotage and grind the entire government to a halt. Now, that's not all. I'm not painting everybody with a, with a broad brush here. But there's enough with the support of the leadership to actually do this. They're sort of carrying out what I think William F. Buckley said tongue-in-cheek a long time ago. Uh, William F. Buckley said that the role of the conservative is to stand athwart history yelling, stop. Any of you who knew Buckley uh, knew that he liked to play around with things like that. I'm sure that was tongue-in-cheek, but I think some of these people actually take it seriously. So historically, um, the filibuster was an extraordinary tool used only in the rarest of instances. Most people think of the filibuster from Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, the 1939 Frank Capra film, which is really interesting because in 1939 there were zero filibusters. For the entire 19th century, there were only 23 filibusters. From 1917, when the Senate first adopted rules on the filibuster, from 1917 until 1969, there were 50. In other words, over a 52-year period, there was an average of less than one filibuster per year. In contrast, during the last Congress, 2007 to 2008, the majority was obliged to file a record 139 motions to end filibusters. 139. Already in this Congress, there have been over 98 motions to end filibuster in this Congress. Let me give you another comparison. According to one study, in the 1960s, just 8% of major bills were filibustered. Last Congress, 70% of major bills were filibustered. The fact is, in successive Congresses, and I have to admit, neither party has clean hands here, Democrats and Republicans have ratcheted up the level of, of obstructionism to the point where 60 votes have become a de facto requirement to even bring up a bill for consideration. Forget about passing a bill, just to even bring it up for consideration. So what was once a procedure used rarely and judiciously has become almost a daily procedure used routinely and recklessly. The problem, however, goes beyond the sheer number of filibusters. First, this once rare tactic is now used or threatened to be used on virtually every measure and every nominee, even those that enjoy near universal support. Again, as Norm Ornstein wrote, the Senate has taken the term deliberative to a new level, 
slowing not just contentious legislation, but also bills that have overwhelming support. Well, here are some examples. In this Congress, the minority filibustered a motion to proceed to a bill to extend unemployment compensation. After grinding the Senate to a halt from September 22nd through November the 4th, during that entire period of time, the bill then passed 98 to nothing. So you have to ask, what was the reason for that? In other words, the minority filibuster bill they fully intended to support just to keep the Senate from conducting other business. Likewise, for nearly eight months, the minority filibustered confirmation of Martha Johnson as administrator of the General Services Administration, certainly a relatively non-controversial position. She was ultimately confirmed 96 to nothing. For nearly five months, the minority filibustered confirmation of Barbara Keenan to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. She was then confirmed 99 to nothing. So why, why was the filibuster used during all that period of time? Second, the filibuster has also increasingly been used to prevent consideration of bills and nominees. Rather than, than to serve to ensure the representation of minority views and to foster debate and deliberation, which you think is what the filibuster is for, right? Big debate, take a close look at things, make sure the minority views are expressed. The filibuster increasingly has been used to assert the tyranny of the minority views and to prevent debate and deliberation, to prevent us from actually debating and deliberating. So what you think of as the filibusters before, well, that was, you know, Mr. Smith and Jimmy Stewart debate, get the views out there. Now the filibuster is being used to even stop debate, stop consideration. It's been used to defeat bills and nominees without their ever receiving a discussion on the floor. In other words, because of the filibuster, the Senate, formerly renowned as the world's greatest deliberative body, cannot even debate these issues. Now, I mentioned there have already been nearly 100 filibusters in this Congress. That's not a cold statistic. Each filibuster represents the minority's power to prevent the majority of the people's representatives from debating legislation, voting on a bill, giving a nominee an up or down vote. Under current rules, if 41 senators chose to do so and to filibuster, no matter how simple or non-controversial, no matter that it may have the support of the majority in the House, a majority of the Senate, a majority of the American people, and the President, that bill or nominee is blocked from even coming before us for consideration. In other words, because of the filibuster, even when a party has been resoundingly repudiated at the polls, that party retains the power to prevent the majority from governing and carrying out the agenda the public elected it to implement. And I think here is the issue, I think, is, is, is at the principle, is at the very heart of our representative democracy, majority rule. Alexander Hamilton, describing the underlying principle animating the Constitution, wrote, quote, the fundamental maxim of Republican government requires that the sense of the majority should prevail. Now, the framers, to be sure, put in place important checks to temper pure majority rule. For example, there are obviously constitutional restraints to protect fundamental rights and liberties. Bill of Rights. The framers, moreover, impose structural requirements. For example, to become law, a bill must pass both houses of Congress identically, and it's subject to the president's veto power. The Senate itself is a check on pure majority rule. As James Madison said, the use of the Senate is to consist in its proceeding with more coolness, with more system, and with more wisdom than the popular branch. To achieve this, person, this purpose, citizens from small states have the same representation in the Senate as citizens of large states. Furthermore, senators are elected for six years, not every two years. So these are structural things put into the Constitution to protect the rights of the minority. I believe these provisions are ample to protect minority rights and restrain pure majority rule. What is not necessary and what was never intended is an extra constitutional empowerment of the minority through a requirement 
that a supermajority of senators be needed to enact legislation or even to consider a bill. Such a veto leads to domination by the minority. As former Republican leader Bill Frist noted, the filibuster, quote, is nothing less than a formula for tyranny by the minority. In fact, the Constitution was framed and ratified to correct the glaring defects of the Articles of Confederation, which required, under the Articles of Confe Confederation, required a two-thirds supermajority to pass any law and then a unanimous consent by every state. Well, the experience under the Articles had been a dismal failure, and the framers were determined to remedy that under a new Constitution. So it's not surprising that the founders expressly rejected the idea that more than a majority would be needed for most decisions. However, in fact, the framers were very clear about circumstances where a supermajority is required. There are five. Ratification of a treaty, override of a veto, impeachment, passage of a constitutional amendment, expulsion of a member. Those are the only five times in the Constitution when you need a supermajority. Now it seems clear to me that those who worship at the shrine of, quote, original intent, uh, that if the framers really wanted a supermajority for moving legislation, they would have done so. They certainly didn't. But a supermajority requirement for all legislation the nominees would, as Alexander Hamilton explained, mean that a small minority could, quote, destroy the energy of government. How appropriate. Could destroy the energy of government. That's what's happening today. Government would be, in Hamilton's words, subject, and get this, quote, to the caprice or artifices of an insignificant, turbulent, or corrupt junta. End quote. Well, I wouldn't go so far as to call the minority in the Senate a turbulent or corrupt junta, but I think Hamilton's point is well taken. And I might digress here just for a moment also on the role of the leader, the minority leader. As I said earlier, in my history in the Senate, uh, the minority leader has been able to work, again, to protect the broad interests of the minority, but to work with the majority to make things function. That was true under Bob Dole, it was true under Frist, it was true under Trent Lott. And I can even point to examples. I mean, we've always had people in the Senate that wanted to stop things. You always had one or two or three that always wanted to stop it. In my time, probably the, probably the clearest example, that was Jesse Helms. Um, and Jesse was great. I mean, he knew the rules of the Senate and... Um, he would do certain things to stop or to block. Uh, but I dare say that under Senator Dole, Senator Frist, Senator Lott, um, Jesse knew he could go so far. But after that, the minority leader would not support him. There were certain bounds. And the minority leader would say, oh, I, I'm not privy to these, but I assume you would say to Jesse Helms, okay, Jesse, you got this, you can do that. But you can't do this, because i got to work with the leader and we got to get this done. But you can do this. And they were kept in bounds. But I compare now the present minority leader, which has no check at all, on a few on the minority side, whose clear intent is not just to change legislation, not just to change it or to modify it, but to actually stop it, just to stop everything from working to stop the Senate from working. And uh, again, I point to the role of a minority leader in trying to overcome that and to work with the rest. But uh, under this minority leader, that's not happening. James Madison also rejected a requirement of a supermajority rule to pass legislation. He said, quote, it would no longer be the majority that would rule, the power would be transferred to the minority. Unfortunately, because of the filibuster, Madison's warning has become the everyday reality of the Senate. And because of the reckless use of the filibuster, our government's ability to legislate and address problems is severely jeopardized. So that's why I introduced legislation to amend the standing rules of the Senate to permit 
a decreasing majority of senators to invoke cloture on a given matter. The way I frame the legislation is that on the first vote, you would require 60 votes. Then two days would have to elapse before you had the second vote on cloture, and then you would then need 57 votes. And then two, door, two more days would lapse, and you would need 54 votes, two more days, 51. But eventually you get to a majority. And you might not need to go to 51. Maybe we couldn't get 60 votes, but maybe there are 58. Or maybe there's 56 or 55. So you can collapse this down and, and move the legislation. And again, under my proposal, a determined minority could slow down any bill for as much as eight days. Senators would have ample time to make their arguments and attempt to persuade the public and a majority of their colleagues. I think this protects the rights of the minority to full and vigorous debate and deliberation, maintaining the very best features of the United States Senate. I also think it would promote compromise. Because if you didn't really know, and you had the 60 votes, and there were maybe 53 or 54 or 55, but not the 60, rather than dragging it out, and then having the vote on the filibuster, having a cloture vote, then after a cloture vote, you, know, you have 30 hours, right, of debate. No amendments can be added after that, and no non-germane amendments. So if I'm one of those minority, and I'm filibustering, and we have the first vote, and there's like 55, well, I can hold it up for two, four, maybe about four or five more days, but I know I'm eventually going to lose. Well, in order to save that four or five days, I might be willing to compromise and let it go if you let me maybe offer this amendment, give me this amount of time, let me do something. You make your compromises, you work it out, and you move ahead. So I think that what the approach that I've taken would tend to promote uh, more, more compromises. As Senator George Hoare noted in 1897, the Constitution framers designed the Senate to be a deliberative form in which, quote, the sober second thought of the people might find expression. That's the way I like to think of the Senate. And maybe in this kind of a, a new environment, we might have a sober second thought. At the same time, this reform would end the tyranny of the minority and really get us back to true representative democracy, a majority rule in the legislative body. At the end, the majority would be allowed to act. There would be an up or down vote on the legislation or a nominee or, or even proceeding to a bill. I, love what, I like what Henry Cabot Lodge once said. He said, quote, to vote without debating is perilous, but to debate and never vote is imbecile. And there's nothing radical about the proposal I've introduced. Uh, the filibuster is not in the Constitution. Until 1806, the Senate adopted basically Robert's Rules of Orders, which allowed a senator to move the previous question and end debate. Of course, that goes back to the British Parliament, Robert's Rules of Order. But that was ended in 1806. Further, there's nothing sacrosanct about requiring 60 votes to end debate. Article 1, Section 5, Clause 2 of the Constitution, that's the Rules and Proceedings Clause, specifies that each house may determine the rules of its proceedings. Well, using this authority, the Senate has adopted rules and laws, for example, that forbid the filibuster in numerous circumstances. How many people know that the Senate actually has rules that forbid the use of the filibuster? In respect to the budget, war powers, international trade acts. You've all heard of fast track. That's what it's about. They don't, you, you can't use a filibuster. So we, you know, we use those rules. Similarly, my legislation, far from being an unprecedented and radical change, stands squarely within the tradition of updating the Senate rules. For example, beginning in 1917, the Senate passed, has passed four significant amendments, the latest in 1975, to its standing rules to limit or modify the use of the filibuster. So I think it's long past time for the Senate to again use its authority to restore its ability to govern effectively and democratically and for the majority of the Senate to exercise its constitutional right. Now, I've introduced my proposal this year as a member of the majority party. The proposal, however, is one, as Dean Rivez said earlier, I introduced in 1995 when I was a member of the minority party. 
So in the court of equity, I come with clean hands. So I want to be clear that the reforms I advocate are not about one party gaining an advantage. It's about the Senate as an institution operating more fairly and effectively and democratically. What I saw in the 90s, as I had seen since, since coming to the Senate in 1985, that, that each time we changed, everything got ratcheted up. So here's, since I've been in the Senate, let's see, it was Republican, led, and then the Democrats were in the majority, Republicans were in the majority, Democrats the majority, Republicans the majority, Democrats the majority. All of this has happened to me since 1985. In the 90s, what I saw happening was a ratcheting up. Well, if you did it to us 10 times in the last Congress, we're going to do it to you 20 times this time. Then the Congress would change, you did it to us 20, we're going to do it to you 40. And it's just the rat, you know, it's, 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 it's like an arms race, it just keeps escalating to where I said right now, 139. The last Congress, over, we're up to 100 now in this Congress. So, again, if we don't end it, it's just going to, uh, as bad as it is now, it's going to get worse. It's just going to get worse. Well, I'll repeat what, uh, what Michael Waldman said when you, uh, you said earlier. You said that uh, Justice Brennan wrote, that the genius of the Constitution rests not in any static meaning it might have had in a world that is dead and gone, but in the adaptability of its great principles to cope with current problems and current needs. The founders adopted the Constitution to enable the American people through their elected representatives to govern. As Chief Justice Marshall made clear in McCulloch v. Maryland, any enduring constitution is designed to and must be able to, quote, respond to the various crises of human affairs. We can't do that now. Unfortunately, I do not see how we can effectively govern a 21st century superpower when a minority of just 41 senators, potentially representing less than 15% of the American people, representing less than 15% of the American people, can dictate action or inaction to the majority of the Senate and the majority of the American people. It's not democratic. Certainly it's not the kind of representative democracy envisioned and intended by the Constitution. You know, if we believe that elections should have consequences, well, people vote for a president, they vote for a Congress, they expect them to do something. And what I, well, the dirty little secret that everyone knows is that if the minority can plug things up and block things up, the American people blame the Congress. Everybody. They blame the president. Everybody. And so, if you want to thwart the will of the majority, this is what you do. And that is exactly what's happening. Well, I could go on, but I wanted to leave some time for questions and dialogue. These remarks are built as a lecture. But I always had a special place in my heart for professors who let class out early. And I'm reminded of one of my favorite Hubert Humphrey stories, who was a, a, a great a friend of mine, but also a mentor. Uh, uh, Hubert Humphrey and McCarthy, Gene McCarthy, that McCarthy. And, um, and Mondale used to always come down to Iowa, and I, I, I think one of the reasons that we were able to get more progressive was because of their influence. But, but Humphrey was well known for being, uh, how shall I say it, loquacious. Uh, and he could go on and on and on, as you may remember, Ted, right? And so one time, as the story goes, Humphrey had been asked to speak for a few minutes, and he got up, and he got on a roll. And he kept talking, and he kept talking, and he kept talking. Finally, his staff, nervous, started giving him all these signs and stuff, and finally Humphrey looked at his watch, and he said, oh, my gosh. He said, I, I was only supposed to speak for 10 minutes. He said, I've gone on for about 45 minutes. He said, I really apologize. He said, but he said, to tell you the truth, the longer I talked, the more I liked what I heard. <laughs> so, so when I talk about filibusters and ending filibusters, the longer I talk, the more I like what I heard. So again, I thank you for inviting me here to speak, and I thank you again, uh, Dean Revez, and all of you here at the Brennan Center for all you do, but especially in the area of civil legal services for our people of this country. Thanks for having me here. Thank you very much for um, really giving us a lot of things to think about. I, I know that many people in this room 
uh, will want to pepper you with questions. Um, but I'm going to take the Brennan Center's prerogative and, uh, and start. Okay. And then we will uh, uh, have time for a few questions from the audience. Um, so one practical problem uh, with reform seems to be almost tautological. The party in the minority wants minority veto power. How would you persuade senators from the minority party to support the change that you propose? And how would you marshal the votes to change the status quo? Um, while I believe that you ought to have rules to live by in the Senate, I don't know that the rules ought to go from one Congress to the next in, per in perpetuity. Uh, for example, the, the rule that we have now, there was two-thirds rule, now it's a 60-vote rule. Why, if you carry that logic on, you could say, well, let's say that one party got 80 people in the Senate at one time. And let's say those 80 people decided to set up rules that would perpetuate their majority. And one of the rules they wrote in is they said it would take 80 votes to change these rules. Does that bind every Senate from then on? Of course not. So that's what people are and say, well, you, you, you had the two thirds. The rules of the Senate say that in order to change the rules, you need 67 votes. Not 60, 67 votes to change the rules. Well, why should I let the dead hand of history bind me? Because of what some people decided nearly a century ago. So, there is a procedure and a process. The uh, Constitution says we make the rules. There's an argument about whether the Senate is a continuing body or not. Uh, I think that's sort of been laid to rest over the intervening years, uh, that the Senate obviously changes. Uh, I mean, since I came to the Senate, I mean, uh, the vast majority of the Senate has been elected since I came there. So there is a process whereby, and this is as this was stated in 1959, no, 1975. The last time we changed the rules, uh, Senator Byrd, who was opposed at that time to changing the filibuster rules, even reducing it to 60, said at that point that it is very clear that if you had a willing person presiding over the Senate and a willing majority leader that a majority of the Senate could change the rules. And here's how you do it. You, um, you send to the desk proposed change in the rules of the Senate. The clerk reads them. The, um, the person sitting in the chair, who at that time would be the Vice President of the United States, calls for the vote. And if a majority votes for it, he says the rules were adopted. The minority then will appeal the ruling of the chair. They appeal the ruling of the chair based upon the 67 requirement. They appeal the ruling of the chair. Under the rules of the Senate, a majority decides that. So a majority of the Senate would vote to uphold the ruling of the chair. And thus, a majority of the Senate can change those rules. And that's exactly how it's going to be done next January. Well, that was going to be my question to you. <laughs> is, there, is there a particular moment in time when this must take place? Yes, when we adopt the rules for the next Congress, after the next election. Um, now, Bill Frist tried, you remember some talk about that nuclear option at one time. But he wanted to do it only for nominees to the court and do it in the middle of a Congress. I said at the time, I said, while I might be very interested in changing the filibuster rules for everything, not just nominees, but for everything, I don't think it would be in our interest to do it in the middle of a Congress. I mean, there ought to be rules that you can at least adhere to for a couple of years that you know what the rules of the game are, uh, but not in the middle of a session. That means we could, well, we would be in the situation of what, um, what Tom DeLay did in Texas uh, with the reapportionment thing, but 
don't get me into that now, but uh, <laughs> it's the idea that you have certain rules, you live by them until there's an orderly process the next time to adopt new rules. Uh, uh, so that would be, yeah, that's, that's, as I said, I don't think it should be done in the middle of a, of, of, of a Congress. And then you could just do it every week. You could do it, you change it every couple of weeks, and you wouldn't have any rules to live by. Right. So. If there were a Republican-controlled Senate. Yes. Would you do, you, do you envision that you could still pass the rules in, at the beginning of the next Congress? Well, I don't know. I'd like to think yes, because I would like to think they would also be interested in moving things, too, and not have the Democrats ratchet it up and filibuster everything for 200 times and all that kind of stuff. If there was a Republican president, unless they just want to stop everything, uh, you, you know, they have agendas, they have things they want to get through. may not be my agenda, uh, but they have theirs, and uh, would they want to have the Democrats do to them? I think this thing is, I think this is taking on uh, a head of steam and a momentum that even Republicans, not all, I'm not saying all, and I, I don't mean to put this in partisan context either, I'm just saying a few people, then there are a few who just literally want to stop the Senate from doing anything. You can't do anything about that. But I think the vast majority want to get things done, want to have an orderly process to it. So I, I don't know. I would think that there would be a possibility that even if there was a Republican president and a Republican majority in the Senate, they would still want to change the rules. Okay. So my last question for you, before we open it up, what can the people in this room do? So many people want to do something to change this situation. Can you think of something that people could do? Well, um, using whatever levers you have uh, to just get people informed of this. I mean, uh, more and more on the, especially on the internet and, and through, the, through the internet, just getting people informed as to why things aren't happening. I mean, because we all get blamed for everything, you know, but the fact is, that showing how the filibuster is being used by just a few people to, to thwart the will of the majority. Um, so, you know, using whatever outlets you can. Secondly, um, uh, one of your senators is head of the Senate Rules Committee. Um, he is having hearings on this right now. In fact, his lead off witness was Walter Mondale on this issue. So we're going to be having more hearings on that, Senator Schumer is, uh, again, moving the ball forward. So to encourage him and to tell him to keep up his activities on that would be, would be, uh, would be very good. Um, but just, you know, I think getting the more and more public aware of, of just how dysfunctional the Senate's become. It's totally dysfunctional. As I said, there will be a small slice of the American people that probably like that. I mean, there are people who just like to tear down all our structures, but the vast majority don't feel that way. Well, I think uh, not only having people understand how dysfunctional it is, but that there are ways to make it better Absolutely. and to encourage yeah. various senators and others to, uh, to, to move that along. And using the, le the legitimate rules of the Senate, that's another thing people forget. I'm not asking us to go beyond or out, outside the bounds of the Senate rules. The Senate rules allow for what I just described, for a majority vote to uphold the ruling of the chair. Great. Ted Sorensen is going to ask Ted, the first question. did you have question. Ted? Thanks very much, uh, Senator, for a brilliant, comprehensive lecture. I learned a lot. It's often said in our critical times that democracy is at stake, at stake in the world, at stake in Afghanistan and Iraq and in other uh, areas of conflict. And often the United States sends out, the State Department sends out uh, folks to lecture on democracy. <laughs> Do we preach to them that it, you don't need majority rule? You can still have a democracy without majority rule? 
Maybe some senators ought to be sent out once in a while <laughs> to preach democracy, how hypocritical that might seem when the United States Senate is not a democracy. Well, what can I say? You're absolutely right. I mean, I, <laughs> I've often thought about how we go out to these other countries and preach representative democracy and stuff, uh, and yet a minority runs up. A minority determines what we do. So it's kind of hypocritical. Let me, let me thank again Senator Tom Harkin for his tremendously insightful talk, for the passion and integrity he brings to this issue. There is one thing at least that all of you who care about this can do. Part of what has to happen over the next year, uh, if there is to be any possibility of reform in January, is for the public to weigh in. The public who isn't seen as self-interested, the public who just wants good government, uh, to build the space for committed people of both parties, like Senator Harkin, to do what they believe is right. The Brennan Center is working on this issue. We have testimony which we are giving and have submitted. Please sign in. If you haven't signed in, please check into our website. I want to thank Kelly Williams and her colleagues uh, who, uh, who have put this event together. And it, as you think about the filibuster, I do have to close with this point, which is not a comment on this evening, but on the, on the Senate perhaps itself. We, uh, Senator, are meeting in Vanderbilt Hall, named after Justice Arthur Vanderbilt of the New Jersey Supreme Court. And he had a saying, which is, reform is not for the short-winded. Well, we have a year to get some reform, so <laughs> we'll do our best. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you.